So we, we were talking about the end times, and the Bible does say in Matthew 24 when he says, in the end of the world, what are the signs of your coming in the end of the world? So we know when we say the terminology of end times, that's not something weird because the Bible says there's going to be an end, there's a close, a countdown. We don't know the countdown, only God knows the countdown. But the verse that we were getting into, because I'm giving you guys overarching principles, instead of just saying, watch for this sign. And we're going to get into some of those signs, and we're actually going to do that, because he says the signs of thy coming. Uh, but he's, th- this one verse, in verse 12, when Jesus was teaching, he says, because iniquity shall abound, and the love of many shall wax cold. So if you missed it last week, we talked about iniqu- uh, sin abounding. The word abound means to, to multiply. And if you weren't here, I'm not going to reteach it, but I'm saying we live in the day and age of multiplied sin. And because a lot of people say things have gotten so bad, things have been bad, things have been bad. I'm telling you, things have been bad. They, they, they would tie up Christians and have lions rip them apart for, for entertainment. Don't tell me things are bad today. Things have been bad. And you say, well, look at the wickedness of the gay pride parades and all this other stuff. Uh, have you ever heard of Sodom and Gomorrah? You know, have you heard of the days of Noah? So, I mean, like, to be blown away that things have gotten bad. Things have been bad. But the difference is when we went through the stats of how we were, sin was bad, and then it multiplied. When I say multiplied, I'm not saying multiplied. I'm saying it multiplied. I mean, on this scale, it just blew up because of technology and sin that is multiplied in this world. So we're definitely in the age of seeing when iniquity is abounding, But that produces, and the love of many shall wax cold. So are we living in a day and age that we're seeing a drastic change of a falling away? Because the Bible talks about it. So question number one, or answer number one, we live in the days of multiplied sin. Number two, we are living in the days of the great falling away. So let's break this down, okay? When it says the love of many shall wax cold, that love is not just love for each other and love for people. That word love there is agape love. That is a love that comes from God. That is God's love. That's a love for God and God loving us. Okay, John 3, 16, and us, we loved him because he first loved us. But the idea of it waxing cold, it literally means it's growing cold. There's a distance there, and you can see it as how people will treat church, how people treat Bibles, how people treat morality, all this stuff that happens in it. But it's not a light switch, okay? It's not like somebody flipped a switch and, oh man, everybody just drifted from God. It's a slow fade, and that's what we're experiencing. But the question is, I ask why? With all that God has blessed us with, why would people turn from truth? Why why would this happen? Because sin has an effect on our culture. I, I take you back to Lot, okay? And Lot steps into this city and not with the idea, I'm going to throw away my whole family. Well, he did. He, he honestly did. He lost his family. Remember when he went running through the city, knocking on the door, saying, the Lord's going to destroy the city. What, what, did, the, what did his uh, son-in-law say to him? Does anybody remember? Mocked they mocked him. They laughed at him. Say, You're, you are crazy. You are crazy. What happens is when you adapt to a culture... When Lot should have knocked on the door, they were like, you know what? Your dad's been preaching this for years. We need to go because your dad knows some things. He's a man of... No, they were like, are you kidding me? Where is this coming from? They mocked him because they adapted the culture around them. By the way, when the Bible talks about lukewarm, and I've preached this many times, how does something become lukewarm? Just let it sit. It adapts to the the, the temperature around it, and that's what happens. You take a church, and I... Man... You take a church that doesn't want to step out on faith, and I'll show you a church that's going to die. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. You've got to be a church that is willing to move forward, reach people. What we did on Sunday, guys, is vital to the future of Fellowship Baptist Church. Let the youth take over and let them be part of everything that we do, and don't stick them in a room and entertain them. They're not the church of tomorrow. They are the church of today. We have this mindset that we're going to entertain kids until they become of age to serve God. Then we've missed it. We're training disciples and warriors of God. There's got to be a mission to go forward. So there's got to be zealous. Uh, we've got to be zealous. We've got to be passionate. The Bible says, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, which literally means that we adapt to the culture around us. Why? That we might prove what is good and acceptable in the perfect will of God. Why is not God? Why is God not returned yet? And we talked about this last week. Because we have a purpose on this earth. What is the purpose of us on this earth? To glorify God. 
The, the reason you were created, the reason why Fellowship Baptist Church exists, the reason why we have Awana and Catalyst and every class and program going on is to glorify God. When, when this program of time ceases to glorify God, then we cease to bring uh, purpose to this world. But we adapt to the world, materialism, morals, standards, and then our light doesn't shine. And then, then the world ends up in the dark and we lose our purpose of this. And what happens is we get busy. And I think is in the culture that we live in, about the, the falling away, we live in a culture that is so busy. Getting people to serve God, or if we have an outreach or whatever, like, I'd love to. I'm just so busy, so busy, so busy. And trust me, I know what it's like. E even while I'm standing here, I'm missing phone calls, okay? I know what it's like to, I, I get it. So I'm not like, you guys are all so busy. I'm like, I get it. We are all so busy. But there's a slow fade. But then we raise kids where we are so busy with running to ball games and working in programs, and we, we tax ourselves so much with, with, with stuff that we have to pay for the stuff to so where we end up working overtime and extra jobs and everything else to pay for our stuff. And I'm not saying that's always. Some people have to work like that just to make ends meet. But a lot of times we do it to ourselves. And the more that the church steps back, the less Christians speak up, the louder Satan's voice become. And what is the big thing that we see today in the world around us? Confusion. It is, it is utter confusion. And man, I could tell you stories even this week of stories and things that I've experienced with friends of mine on Facebook. Confusion, confusion, confusion. So this is a big sign of the return of Christ. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, that the man of sin should be revealed in the sign of perdition. So we, there's going to be a great falling away that's going to set the stage for what's to come. You know, it, it, the, the, the Antichrist just can't step into a world that is literally thriving for Jesus Christ. We'd be like, no way. But we're set in the stage by the apathy that's taking over this world. So why does God allow this? And it's the same reason we talked about with Sodom and Gomorrah. If I, if I find 50, 40, 30, and he goes all the way down, the Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some may count slackness, but long suffering to us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The heart of Jesus Christ is to glorify God, but also at the heart of Jesus Christ is that he's not willing that any should perish. So we, we have this sin abounding in the, 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 the long suffering of God at the same time. So I ask the question, are we seeing a great falling away? So now let me, basically I'm going to read, just so if I'm not looking at you, I'm, I'm going to read most of this. Uh, I, I like doing this. It's just a kind of an overarching history. Um, so let's do a short history lesson. And let's, let's talk about the last couple of hundred years of, uh, of culture. And I'm and not just saying America, although it, a lot of it focuses on that. And in 1750 to 1950, Harvard University, the school was highly religious in the 1600s. And I know a lot of you guys know this, but it's so funny to see the drastic change of things today. Harvard's rules and precepts declared, let every student be plainly instructed to know God and Jesus Christ, which is eternal life, John 17, 3. Can you imagine today? <laughs> Can you imagine today? Any institution whatsoever proclaiming that as, as, as their statement of faith. Okay, among its graduates, 50% of them were ministers. Prior to the revolution, 10 out of 12 Harvard presidents were also ministers. Yale was started by clergymen. Princeton's first year of class was taught by a preacher, Jonathan Dickinson. Uh, Dickinson. Uh, uh, Princeton's crest still says today, which it's, it's amazing that it does, under God she flourishes. During this time that we're talking about these couple of hundred years, William Carey, the great leader in world missions, translated portions of the scripture into more than 40 languages, 102 mission schools were opened out with nearly 7,000 students. During this time, Jonathan Edwards preached the message, which you guys are familiar with, centers in the hands of an angry God. Messages like this opened the door for the Great Awakening. Okay, July 8, 1741, on this day uh, in history, Jonathan Edwards started a sermon that did not finish. Such was impacted by the preaching that the people listened to shrieked and cried out, and the crying and the weeping became so loud that Edwards was forced to discontinue his sermon as people were repenting and falling on their face before God to get saved. 
Bars would close down as revivals would spread. Revivals would shut down the city. D.L. Moody preached having meetings between 15 and 30,000 people. He preached from uh, nation to nation with overwhelming crowds in attendance. During this time, Billy Sunday, Billy Sunday was still one of the uh, 20th, uh, 20th, 20th century's best known evangelists. Over the course of his career, Sunday probably preached more than 100 million, to 100 million people face to face, most of which he did not without even microphones. He did it just by the voice that God gave him. Sunday was estimated to have preached nearly 20,000 sermons, an average of 42 per month from 1896 to 1935. In 1960, he went to Baltimore and built a tabernacle called the Salvation Shed. Seated 15,000 people and 5,000 or more would stand during the services just to get in. On the last day, 24,000 people filled the building four times so that Billy Sunday preached about uh, 96,000 people during one day. More than 23,000 people received Christ as their Savior on the closing night as the baseball star Home Run Baker and four other New York Yankees were saved at the same time. In Kansas City, 40,000 people came in the rain to the opening service. In Pittsburgh, 26,000 conversions were recorded. In Columbus, Ohio, 18,337 were saved. In New York, 22,229 received Christ. Now, guys... We get excited if we see one, and that's not belittling the one by any means because all of heaven rejoices over one sinner that comes to repentance. But I'm saying, let me keep going, okay? I'm, I'm all in the same time period, okay, is what we're talking about. I'm just saying, is, are we seeing a great falling away? Has there been a transition? How about Hudson Taylor who traveled five and a half months on a ship to get to China? By the, by the time of his death, he, he, had, he had reached... 849 other missionaries to turn over the work to, 250 mission stations, and 125,000 Chinese converts. Churches, colleges, revivals, printing, evangelists, missionaries were in full speed. Churches were respected. Pastors were respected. Christians were respected. The Bible was used and the Bible was prominent in schools. They would teach the plan of salvation. They would have people pray. They would open up the school over the intercoms with prayer. Why? Because we were one nation under God. Things were much different. We were talking about revivals where people would line up in the, in the streets to get into the building. People squirm the day now if you go 10 minutes over. Standing through sermons that were hours long and meetings that would last months at a time. So what happened? After World War II, Japan became an open door to Christian missions. General Douglas MacArthur made a plea to send 5,000 5, missionaries to the country because the country was an open door, and the gospel was spreading. It wasn't just in one location. Then something happened. In 1945, World War II ended. America climbed out of depression. There's something about having nothing that drives you to your knees, because when you have everything, and you're, oh, what's the words? Increase with goods and have need of nothing. Revelation, the Laodicean church. That's what happens. When you don't need God, things change. Your perspective changes. There's something about having nothing. Being in need humbles a person, and it drives you to seek after God. The Great Depression went through the 20s, 30s, and 40s. Then the world was somewhat at peace again. Businesses were growing, industries, plants, production, cars, entertainment, because all that stopped during the war, because every effort went towards the gasoline and production and everything went towards the war, along with the workforce, and people got busy, really busy. We call it the American dream. Work more, two cars, bigger house, having all these things. And Americans got off their knees and got to work. And money was good and the economy was growing. But what once was luxuries is now everyday necessities of eating out in movies. And we're not knocking that stuff. I'm just saying a shift of priorities. And this leads to apathy. And apathy is the opposite of being zealous for God. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth, because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing. And thou knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. You guys see the the picture in your notes, that the picture of the news clipping? And I know that you guys know this, because in June 25th, 1962, the U.S. Supreme Court declared school, uh, prayer in school, to be unconstitutional. 
Did, 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 did that make a difference? Because I mean, all it is is prayer and school. But you know what? The found, if the foundations be destroyed, what will the righteous do? Because all of a sudden, it wasn't just prayer and school. It was separation of church and state. It was the idea that God and creation and morals and, and all these other things shouldn't be mentioned to, to students. So it was not just the idea of prayer being removed. It was the idea of God being removed. But the thing, God says, without me, you can do nothing. When you remove God, you remove truth. Remember, when we say the great falling away, it's not just a great falling away from church attendance. It's a great falling away from truth. That is the difference. It's a great falling away from truth. And what the great falling away from truth is what changes our morals, which changes absolute truth. If there is no absolute truth, then everybody does that which is right in their own eyes. You know what I'm saying? Whether it's right to kill a baby or a partial birth abortions or... I mean, you, you just go down the list of all these different things. Well, who's to say that I'm wrong because I don't feel that way? Well, the, what changes feelings, the fact is the fact that we stand on the rock of God's word. That's what changes everything. Fifteen years before 1963, and we're going back to the date of when everything changed in 1962, of prayer being removed. Fifteen years before 1963, pregnancies in girls from ages 15 to 19 had been no more than 15 per thousand after 1963, pregnancies increased 187% in the next 15 years. Now, I'm going to say, was it, you guys see, what is, what is the trend? Revivals, gospel, preaching, churches, prayer meetings, like this. We're just saying, when, when America declared, we don't need God, I'm just going to ask you, was there a change? Was there a change? For younger girls, ages 10 to 14, pregnancies since 1963 are up 553%. Before 1963, sexually transmitted diseases among students were 400 per thousand. Since 1963, they were up 226% in the next 12 years. Before 1963, divorce rates had been declining for the last 15 years. After 1963, divorce uh, increased 300% each year. Not 300% increase, percentage increase each year for the next 15 years. Since 1963, unmarried people living together is up 353%. Because the question is, why not? You know, you know what I'm saying? That, that's where it comes down to. And the world's philosophy is, how do I know we're compatible? Or how do we know that we're going to get along? And all these other things are financially uh, more convenient to live this way. Because you've taken out the Word of God. Today, among those 18 to 24, cohabitation is now more than uh, prevailing than living with the spouse. It's, it's, the, the, it's shifted in that direction. And the Bible says, as in the days of Noah, what was the sin mentioned in Genesis? Well, the main sin in Genesis was violence. 1963, violent crimes increased 544%. Not only has it increased, now we've turned it into entertainment. Because now even rap artists will sing about what it's like to cap somebody and beat people up and all this other stuff. Have we experienced a great falling away? Yes. From God, from truth, from church, from morals. But it's not just the world, but it's the church. And, and I know it's one and the same because the light of the world is the church. And so the church has influence over the world to, to be that voice to say it doesn't have to be that way. So as we, Jesus said, don't let your candle put it under a bushel. Why is that? Because we can be saved and have no light. Because it is the, 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 the morals that we live and the character that we display. From 1990 to 2000, the combined membership of all Protestant denominations in the U.S. declined by almost 5 million members, while the U.S. population increased by 24 million. Population going this way, churches declining going this way. And there's a chart in your notes that shows you this. Over the past 15 years, the drop in church attendance has been twice as great as the decline of the 1960s and 1970s. In the last 15 years, the drop of church attendance has been twice, twice. And we see it. I mean, there's no question there. I mean, you talk about 20,000 people lining up to get into a church service. <laughs> it's not the same at all. Decline is multiplying number. It's not just a decline. And that's why we're saying the Bible says, will there be a great falling away? 6,000 to 10,000 churches, depending on the year and the way that you view it, churches in the U.S. are dying each year, declining, declining of people being added, people being saved, people being baptized. 
A study from LifeWay Research found that uh, 3,700 churches closed in just 20, 2014, just in one year. On average, among the stats, 40 to 60 percent, 40 to 60 percent of those that claim to attend church are inactive, meaning they attend church about 12 times a year. So that really means, so even if you take the stats of those that are going to church and say, do you go to church? 40% of them go once a month. The, uh, the closest we've gotten to any type of modern day revival has really been the days of Billy Graham and the crusades that he brought. Uh, even looking at the church today, we've gotten comfortable of lukewarm. The idea of stepping out on faith, moving forward, or making uh, any kind of progress for has become oblivious. It is easy to get comfortable, guys. It is easy. You know one of the reasons why God really put it on our heart to play in a church? Because it was uncomfortable. I'm just going to be honest. Do you know how hard it was for me for, for, to, to have 60 people come up to me and say, we're going to go? I'm, I'm thinking, man, 60 people, <laughs> like that's a lot. We are not building the kingdom of Fellowship Baptist Church. We are not. And, and it's, it, it is about the work of God and walking by faith and, and moving by faith. And guys, I, I'm constantly praying. I met last night with the trustees. We met for almost four hours and, and just talking about vision and what we're going to do next and moving forward. And I can't wait to share with some of you guys this Sunday night for the business meeting at five o'clock that we're going to be talking about some of those things. But uh, Revelation 319, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. But it's not so much about him just saying, don't be lukewarm. And I know I've repeated this and said this. It says, be what? Zealous. zealous. Therefore, and repent. If you're not zealous, what is the command? Repent. <laughs> Literally. How you doing? We're okay here. Just we're getting by. God's not okay with that. God is not okay with churches just saying we're getting by. It has to be where there is no vision, the people perish. And, 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 I'm, and I'm not talking, guys. I'm it, it's talking about vision for the next generation. It's, a, it's about discipleship and evangelism and the things that we do. So has it affected our nation and our world? Absolutely. Are we seeing a falling away? Yes. But let's look at it from a different perspective. It's not just are we seeing a falling away, but what are the effects of the falling away? The next generation has been indoctrinated with sin of our culture. He says, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Okay, so, so why is that? Guys, let me illustrate this. And you guys know this. But the thing is, the more people get away from truth, and I've used this illustration many times, the more people get away from truth, the more that seems crazy. It, it really is. It's like sex before marriage and abortion and, and love is love. And why in the world are you going to tell me that I can't love this person? I'm not. He is. And that's what it comes into because he's the one from the foundation of the world that created marriage and created uh, what it means to have peace of mind and unity in marriage and how things are going to work. He's the one that created it. But as you get further and further away from what works, everybody does that which is right in their own eyes. What happens is the same sin as Satan had is pride. So you come up and say, you know, you're not supposed to live that way. Who are you to tell me what I can and cannot do? Who are you to tell me? Who are you to tell me? And then so you've got this whole nation that is just irate over Christians that are narrow-minded, old-fashioned, and hateful. Do you guys notice how much of that is? It's come up now that um, they were doing um, a a big campaign for something and Chick-fil-A was behind it. They didn't label Chick-fil-A as being behind it. Do you know what they labeled it as? Uh, a, 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 a hate-generated something-something organization that is anti-gay and anti-abortion. They, they didn't say anything about the good. That the, the whole description of them was they were hateful, hateful, hateful because they stood against things. So the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own loss, what makes them feel good, they will heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. Just bring in people that are going to just make me feel good Tell me what I'm doing right. And guys, we're seeing that. And guys, I'm not afraid to say this, and I say this with love, but I say this with conviction. Any church that can wave a gay flag as, as part of drawing people in is not right with God. Amen. They're not. 
Because you cannot sit there and wave something that's representing sin and think that you're right with God. You cannot do it. And, and, and that's not me being hateful. That's me saying, thus saith the Lord, who is our authority in our lives. It, it's not right. And, and so what you have is you have a, a pastor that stands before them that's going to tell them whatever they want to hear that's going to bring in a crowd because they don't want to be offended. They have itching ears. They, they just, just tell me what I want to hear. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and they shall be, turn into fables. It's just, they'll make it up. Man, now the Spirit speaketh expressly, the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devil. This is spiritual warfare, seducing spirits, twisting the things of God. Uh, that, the spiritual warfare, it's not, it's, it's not so much them coming in saying, you know, God doesn't love you. It, it's, it's the matter of them taking the things that we stand on as being truth about what marriage should be, and children obey your parents, and they're twisting that as uh, even disciplining kids. Even the idea of saying to spank a child now has become, if you say those words, you know, you're, you're, you're borderline going to prison. <laughs> like, and I'm not just joking with that. It just twisted everything. It's spiritual warfare. So what happens is preachers now, because you have to pay the bills. I mean, you got to pay the bills, right? So what do you got to do? Well, I'm just going to not preach that because that's offensive and I don't want to get up and offend people. I mean, it's like just being honest. I, I, guys, it, I, I'm not saying that it's not a fleshly struggle. Uh, a few months ago, uh, I, I did a, a message and, and I, I meet with these people and I know that they're living together. But then when I get to the passage, when I was doing what it means to be different, and I talked about you say priest marital sex is wrong. You shouldn't be living with somebody that's not your spouse like that. And to get, see people get up and walk out of the service and never come back. And you know what I'm saying? So it's like, is it not easy in the back of our mind just saying, well, I'll skip that chapter. Or I don't have to go deep into that verse. But it's not right. It is not right. We cannot do that because I'll tell you what, if the foundations be destroyed, what will the righteous do? We just take little pieces at a time and it crushes the foundation. And you know what? The foundation is the word of God. But when we start removing it, there's nothing to build on. This also know in the latter days, perilous times will come. Difficulties because men shall become lovers of their own selves, coveters, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parent unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good. If, if you go into that and you understand that it's talking too, that he's talking to the church and Christians too, primarily with a lot of these things that he's speaking of, it's not just the lost. But the more you get away from biblical truth, Christians then will be raising up kids that are rebellious against God and rebellious against what's right. We have pulled so far away from God's word that there's no right and wrong. Rebellion against authority, lawlessness, defund the police, you know, even that, that kind of stuff. And guys, I have no problem saying any of this, just so you know. <laughs> like, I just, right is right, wrong is wrong. I, I have no problem saying any of this, and this is being recorded right now and put it on Facebook. But I'm saying that's the attitude of nobody's going to tell me what to do. So much of this is nobody's going to tell me what to do. It's a matter of we want to bring God down to our level, and it does not work that way. Traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. If we don't mind sacrificing for the things of this world and we, we cease to give to the work of God, there's a problem with the church. If we cease to send out missionaries and we're not increasing the giving to be able to send missionaries around the world, but we can increase... Uh, the size of our house and the luxury of our car, something's wrong. And he said in the next chapter, after he says all this, so we go from chapter 3 to chapter 4, he says, preach the word and be instant in season and out of season, reprove and rebuke and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. You, you can't leave anything out. And you know why he says in season and out of season? You preach it when it's popular and you preach it when it's not. Right. That's what that means. It's in season and out of season. So we'll close this part of this up by going back to the illustration of the days of Lot. Why did God do it? Because 
they cease to bring glory to God. And Abraham drew near and said, Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Preventure there be fifty righteous within the city. Wilt thou destroy and spare not the place for fifty righteous? And God said, Yes. Forty, thirty, twenty, ten. And in America right now, you're going, and I know it's not on the same scale, but we are. And, and I just proved it by the stats. It's just, and, and, and he says this in the days of Lot. It's, it's going to come to where fine, and churches, attendance, and things like that, and it's just going to change. And he said, oh, let it, the Lord be, uh, be angry, and I will speak yet once. Peradventure ten shall be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for ten sake. You know what that is? That is the grace and the long suffering of God. Did they find 10? No, they did not. Um, are we living in the last days? We live in the days of multiplied sin. We live in the days of a great falling away. And we can also know from the principle of time that, that God has established. Now, uh, it's 737, so if you guys will bear with me, I, this is one of my favorite things to teach. And next week... I have um, a couple more principles that I, th I think is going to be really cool about living in the last days, uh, just things that the Bible says to, to watch for. But um, I, I'd like to jump into this, if you guys don't mind. I, I'd, I, I'd, I'd like to talk about, and, and I am not, just can I say this before? I am not, I don't twist numbers in the Bible, because some people are like, if you take this chapter and divide it by this chapter, it equals this verse. And I'm like, okay, you just, you just weird, okay? You're just stretching things. <laughs> I'm like, I just can't get into that. I, you guys know what I'm talking about. And people write these books about all this stuff, and, and I just, I don't know. I, I, I just know I can take the Bible for what it says, and, I, and I'm not going to add to it or take away from it. I'm just going to take it for what the Bible says. But these are some observations, okay? Can I give you this? God desires for us to know his plan and purpose for time. Because from the very beginning, God established time. God established a timeline, and God uses it as all through Scripture. So let me explain this in light of end times. In 2 Peter 3.1, The second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, both, both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. So he's saying there, he says, can I, can I make you think a little bit? He said, can I stir you up in this way? That you be mindful of the words which were spoken before the holy prophets and command of the, the apostles of our Lord and Savior. He tells them to look back at the Old Testament, the holy prophets, and tells them to remember the commandments of the apostles. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers. So what are we talking about? We're talking about prophecy and end times and last days walking after their own loss and saying, where's the promise of thy coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Scoffers, meaning you guys have been saying that rapture thing forever and ever. You know, that's what they're going to say. I'm not listening to that. The coming of Christ, the coming of the day of the Lord, all that stuff, it's just crazy. For willingly, they are ignorant of that by the, the word of God and of the heavens of old. And the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. So he talks to the reference of the days of Noah, and he starts talking about that. He talks about the evidence of God. He talks about the word of God proclaims these things. It's that you don't have to be ignorant of this. It talks about them willingly ignore the warnings of God. You know, if how many people, when we have America that's got radio and internet and Facebook and screaming out the message to them all over and they turn it off. But the heavens and earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of the ungodly men. So he starts tying this into the end and judgment and the warnings of God. And it's not going to be by water, but it will be by fire. But beloved, be we're not ignorant of this one thing that in as one day is with the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. Whoa, stop. Okay, why that? Why that? Okay, I mean, we talked about judgment of God. God's going to come back. And then he throws in one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is a day. So he's talking about time. God talks, God talks about time a lot in the Bible. Okay? Don't be ignorant of this one thing. Did you get that? It's not even like, he said, guys, get this, okay? He says, I want you to comprehend something. So God is speaking in terms of times, days, and years. 
And there's a lot to be learned from this. So in Isaiah 46, 9, remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me. Listen to what he says, declaring the end from the beginning. Okay? So, talking about time. He, he said, I'm, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to declare the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, the things which are not yet, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do my pleasure. Declaring the end from the, he declares the end by looking at the beginning. He says, if you want to understand this, go back to this. And we, ha- we have time at the beginning. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, the things which are not yet, the things that have to come. But he said, declaring. He said, I want you to understand something. Get this. Ringing the bell. I'm going to teach something. I'm going to declare this. I have a plan. The word of God is light, which literally means that he eliminates confusion. He, he, he shines the light so we can see things. And the Bible was filled with prophecy when things were coming. It wasn't a shock about the warning of the flood because God sent them to preach about it. It wasn't shocked about the fire of Sodom and Gomorrah because they, they sent them warnings to tell them about. Uh, the Old Testament pointed to the New Testament. They preached about it. We are not in the dark. Surely the Lord God will do nothing but revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. God is always given warning, even with the teachings of Jesus Christ. He says, what shall there be beside the signs of your coming? And he starts teaching these things. So let me illustrate this. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. He said, the times and the seasons, this book uh, of other passages have explained this. So this is, he's going to say, this is nothing new for you to understand. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord cometh as a thief in the night. You know how the Lord's going to come? He's going to come as a thief in the night. What does that mean? Thieves? Or or, or nobody plans on a thief. That's the whole plan. But listen to what he says. When he talks about his coming as a thief, he is speaking of the lost, not the saved. You you plan for a thief because we know he's already said coming in this way. But brethren, ye are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. He said, you guys are different. You've got the word of God. I'm going to lay it out to you. I'm going to preach it to you. You are children of the light and the children of the day, which are not in the night nor the darkness. So everything that he explained there, he says, none of this should take you by surprise. It's, it's, it's bad if churches are not preaching and teaching this stuff. And guys, I know I, I almost feel convicted for teaching some of this stuff because I'm in a class of, uh, of 40 some people right now. And, and, and on Sunday, we had 560 some. I, I, I need to turn my pulpit around and go to that group and preach this stuff too. So some of this stuff, if I preach in the near future, I don't want you to not show up because but I'm just convicted about this because it needs to be preached. But we need to, the basic line, when he comes back, we should not be taken off guard. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. So what's our instruction is those that are holding the word of God right now, wake up, watch, see, put the pieces together, be awake, understand. When he comes, let's be ready for it. This is why we have prophecy. This is why we have the word of God. And this is why Jesus said, so likewise, when you shall see all these things, know that it is near, even at the doors. He didn't say you're going to know, but he said, when you see all these things, and I've given this illustration before, when they come over the radio, when you're on a flight and they say, uh, you know, they're going to come around and pick up all the trash. And they said, put up your tray tables and all that. I don't know when we're going to land, but I know it's close. You know what I'm saying? It's just like you have that mindset. And that's what he's saying. When you see these signs, know that it is near, even at the doors. And I'm going to reiterate when I say this. We do not know the day nor the hour, but we do know the signs, and we do know the season. We know the season. God has a calendar. God has established time, and God has established a timeline. So we're going to start at the beginning of time, declaring the end from the beginning, declaring the end from the beginning. So he says, let me point this to you. And from the ancient times of things that are not yet. So let's start at the beginning. Genesis 1, seven days of creation. God could have created everything all at once, but he didn't. Could God not have said, let there be everything? <laughs> like, boom, everything was happened. I guess you'd call that a big bang. I'm kidding. <laughs> um, And everything was on purpose. Everything has a reason. God established basic principles which everything would follow. He was creating order. He was creating a timeline. And God saw the light, and it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day. And the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. 
So he made it clear a day, an evening, and a morning, and he established time at the very beginning, okay? So six days of creation, six days of doing something different, building up to the seventh day of rest. Seventh day he finished. Seven in the Bible is the number of completion in the Bible. He teaches us something. He was establishing something important. So what does this teach us about time? One, God counts time in sevens. And you say, prove it to me. Okay, here we go. This foundational principle goes beyond just creation. In Israel, even until this day, Israel allows their land to rest from working of the land. Uh, and, and they do that in times of seven. After seven times of seven years, they have the time of ju- Jubilee. When it came to Israel, time was always measured in sevens. Okay, Daniel 9.24, 70 weeks determined upon the people and upon the holy city. city and he goes through and he establishes seven. Upon the 15th day of the same month, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, seven days you must eat unleavened bread. This has been used a lot to prove a point, not just there, but throughout history. He said in Genesis 7, 4, For yet seven days I will cause rain upon the earth. Seven. Genesis 41, seven years of plenty and seven years of famine with Joseph. Why seven? Because that finished the program that he was doing. It finished the point. Animals had to be seven days old before they were sacrificed, a period of time. Seven days they marched around Jericho. Seven days they did it seven times. Seven priests blew seven trumpets, and it was finished. Jacob worked for Rachel for seven years. He worked for Leah for seven years. Seven clean animals were on the ark. Elisha and Nahum, uh, Nahum, Naaman, thank you, sorry, they have seven times in the river. I'm trying to finish, I promise. Jesus spoke seven times on the cross, and at the end of it, he declared, it is finished. Seven times. How much is this used in the Bible? Seven is used 735 times in the Bible. If we included this count, how many times sevenfold and 70th is used, it jumps up to 860 references. The Bible started with seven days. The Bible ends with seven years of tribulation. Revelation, 54 times seven is used. Seven stars, seven churches, seven letters, seven candles, seven years of tribulation, seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls. Just random? So just random? Just coincidence? God was preaching a message to us, again, from the start to the end. Seven days of creation, he was teaching us this lesson to learn from the beginning. Let, it, let me show you something that I learned that I'm going to just show you that I think is cool, but I, I can, can, can it's okay if I just do that, or like, just because it's interesting. Why did God separate and point out the seven days? And could it be that it all lined up with history? Could it be that the seven days kind of match up? Now, this is one of those things that, Tony, I'm not writing this into FBC doctrine, okay? I'm just going to say this is cool. It just goes under the cool category. Day one, God divided the light from the darkness, and God saw the light was good, and he divided the light from the darkness. The first thousand years of time, the biggest event happened where man was separated from God. God separated the water from the land, and God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament and the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. The biggest event that happened in the second thousand years is the flood happened, okay? Day three, God created a plant life, seed-bearing plants. In the third um, thousand years, God said, let the earth bring forth, gra-, or in Genesis, he said, let the earth bring forth grass and yielding seed and fruit trees, yielding fruit after its kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. In the third millennial of time, God established a covenant with Abraham that he would bless and multiply his seed. In day, day four, God created the sun, moon, and stars. And again, you would, you would think that that would start before the plants, Okay, you know, typically if you thought about it in progression of how plants would be, and God made two great lights, and the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night, and he made the stars also, and God set them in the firmament in the heaven to give light upon the earth. In the fourth millennium of time, Jesus came into the world, and he was the light of the world. All things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And I am come to the light of the world. The seed of Abraham walked in darkness until Christ came. Day five, God created living creatures. And God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly moving creatures that have life, fowls that fly above the earth, opening the firmament in heaven. 
Jesus said, it's his mission, I have come that they might have life and they might have it more abundantly. Day six, God created man. Six is the number of man. Man was told to fill the earth. Man has multiplied for more than the last thousand years, all the years before. But 1950, in the sixth millennium of time, in 1950, we were, went from 2.5 billion to right now there's over 8 billion people on the earth. So what did God do on the seventh day? He rested. What, does God, what would God do in the seventh millennium? Rest. If it's a millennium rain. The last thousand years and hold on the dragon, the serpent, which is the devil, and bound him for a thousand years and cast him in the bottomless pit and shut him up, set a seal upon it that he should receive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must loose him for a little season. We end the last thousand years of human history with a thousand years millennium reign of Christ, which is no longer six the number of man, it's seven for completion. All of this is measured by time. By the way, what happens at the end of time after the rapture, when we, rapture, when we are all with Jesus, we are the bride of Christ. A wedding feast that is celebrated for guests, guess how many days that the wedding was celebrated? Seven. Seven. How long was the tribulation period? Seven years. So what do we do during that time? Oh, we have, we're the bride of Christ, <laughs> the, the, the party. So let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the lamb is come, and the wife hath made herself ready. And he saith unto me, Right, blessed are they which call unto the marriage supper of the lamb. And he saith, These are the true sayings of God. God measures in sevens from the beginning to the end, and God established time. Now, just so you guys know, it's just interesting, okay? Can, can you give me that? I'm just saying, and you might say that's a stretch, and I kind of thought that when I was reading through this, and I thought, but it's still interesting, to say the least. But this part, God is given a measure of time. Time is also known uh, that we are on a timeline. Uh, Luke uh, 3, 23 through 38 lays out the entire timeline of the Old Testament, and God's always done this in the Bible. And it was in the son of Enos and the son of Seth, which was the son of Adam, which was the son of God. And you can go back to the Old Testament and read their exact ages. When I say their exact ages, think about how God was precise about time. You say, God, it's not about time. God doesn't live within time. But when it comes to the life of man, when it comes to our purpose on earth, he was very meticulous about time. To the point, and he says, on all the days of Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. And Seth lived 105 years and begot, uh, and begat Enos. Uh, it, look, look at how detailed he is this with, uh, with uh, the next one. 600 years of the day of Noah's life. In the second month and the second day of the month, the same were all the foundations of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were opened up. God goes into great detail to be exact about time which is how we know that we're not been here for millions of years. Have you have, doesn't that frustrate when you people 50 billion years ago, and you're like, whatever. We know that's not true because the Old Testament tells us from the time of Jesus, from the time of the Old Testament to the time of Jesus was 4,000 years. So from uh, 4,004 BC, counting down to 4 BC of Christ, and now today we're at 2023. So if you take... 4,000 years plus 2023, we're at 6,023 years. So Genesis till now is 6,000 around that time. Going back to Genesis, how it all started, six days of creation was the number of man. And then at the rest of that was man's rule. And then it turned over to where God started to rest. So millennium reign is the last thousand years. Now I am not by any means whatsoever saying that, I, I'm just doing math. If you guys know what I'm saying, I'm just doing math. And I, and I think the math of these verses, when he said, go back to the beginning and establish seven, and you go through how God did that, and you see through the sequence of time. I'm just saying that we don't know the day nor the hour. And I'm not even saying that. You, you guys cannot walk out of here and say, well, Tony just nailed, nailed, nailed down a time. I did not. <laughs> but I can, I can clearly say that I believe that we're nearing the end. And I think that the days that multiplied sin, I'd say the great falling away, 
I'd say if, if you even, to, does anybody know another timeline of sequences of uh, periods of time that people believe that are written in the Bible? Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah, okay. So if you take the seven church ages, if you take before the rapture happens in Revelation and you go, what does he do is he has seven churches. And that's why people will say we believe that we're living in the days of Laodicea because there's seven church ages. And the same way that I went through Genesis, laying that out and explaining how that kind of all breaks down of how it compiles with history, a lot of people believe that the seven churches, Pastor, uh, or, uh, Brother Fenwick, have you ever heard that? Oh, yeah. Yes. And it's not true. And you know what? And, there's, and the reason why we say that it's not true because there's nothing to prove it. Mm-hmm. There, there's nothing that did. Does it line up with uh, like things that happen in history? Yes. But it's the same thing that I'm going through with the six days of creation. Does it line up with things, and does, is there things that you could draw parallels? Yes, but there's nothing to prove it. But the, it does prove that God works in sevens. And so go back to how we started. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is what the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. Why is this said? Because God was establishing time, and God was telling us to be awake. And if anything, if I come down to one thing, just remember that God is not slack concerning His promise. He is long-suffering to us. And every day that God does not come back is just simply the grace of God. It is nothing more than God saying, I give you one more day to preach. I give you one more day to witness. I give you one more day to share the gospel. That's what we do. And that's why we're here.